Edwin, thank you, and a pleasure to be here again. Um, so in this, in today's agenda, I can see that you've already seen and heard about the global burden of HIV and the global burden of TB, uh, global burden of malaria, sorry. And of course, TB completes those, that, that group of three pathogens, which I would describe as being the difficult pathogens. They are, they used to be called the big three. Uh, that was in a pre-COVID world. Um, because obviously globally, these three pathogens have an enormous uh, uh, impact on global health, uh, but they are also, for their own individual reasons, the hardest three pathogens probably for us to make vaccines against. So I'm just going to try it. TB, the DB field moves quite slowly, I think, to mirror the slow rate of replication of our pathogen. Um, so, um, but I'm going to try and just give you a snapshot of what we, what we think about how to develop a TB vaccine, some concrete examples, of what vaccines have been tested, uh, some of the upcoming vaccine work, um, and, and really some of the challenges. And then really, really happy to take your questions and discussion. Okay, so TB remains a very significant global health problem throughout the world. I'm not sure I need to tell anyone that. Uh, when I first started working on TB, people said to me, haven't we eradicated TB? And of course, we've never, ever come close to eradicating TB. That would be a fantasy. Um, so, um, uh, and, but I think people don't think that anymore because there has been so much greater global awareness, public awareness of, of the TB. And of course, what COVID has taught us, amongst many other things, is that we live on a small planet. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, you can't just think about TB as being a problem in, in a low middle income setting or in Africa. So that's the latest figures, 10.6 million new cases, 1.6 million deaths. Um, drug resistance, particularly multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant strains are a real problem throughout the world, uh, particularly in India, China, uh, Eastern Europe, former USSR. The geographical overlap with the HIV epidemic has had a devastating impact uh, globally. Um, and even with highly active antiretroviral therapy and complete virological suppression, people with HIV are more likely to get TB. It's estimated that a quarter of the world's population are latently infected. And of course, that latent infection can convert to active disease should those people become immunosuppressed for any reason. COVID has made it worse. I mean, you all have heard this story before over the last two weeks, I'm sure, but uh, there is no doubt at all that the COVID pandemic has worsened our ability to control the TB epidemic. Um, I point out to you that so before 2020, TB was the leading cause of the single uh, pathogen most responsible for deaths um, in infectious diseases. Uh, there was a little blip where COVID dominated the headlines. Um, but of course, now again, we're back with COVID uh, being the leading infectious killer throughout the world. And it will continue like that uh, until we can really lobby and, and get better investment in this pathogen that's been around since the pharaohs. COVID, of course, led to disruption in high income settings, but of course, it had a devastating effect on healthcare settings in low and middle income countries. Um, there's, it's estimated that there's been a 3% increase in incidents um, and over 100,000 increase in deaths in the last year alone. And it's estimated that it'll take us 10 years to get back to where we were pre-COVID with TB. So, you know, this is, this is a problem. Um, we need a roadmap. Um, it's important to have ambitious goals, um, but increasingly as we approach 2030, these ambitious goals look rather unfeasible. Um, so this is the fourth global plan to stop TB. Uh, it is important to have a roadmap. Um, it's taken the uh, goals, obviously, from the SDGs. Um, it's a five-year investment plan. Uh, you can see the numbers there. We need 250 billion US dollars. Um, a relatively paltry $10 billion to uh, fund the full testing and manufacture and deployment of a vaccine. Um, that may sound like a lot, but it's 10 times less than the global community spent on COVID. And I think uh, I used to spend my career comparing the investment between TB and HIV because TB investment is dwarfed by the investment in HIV. Now we have a new target. Um, 
Okay, and this figure, which many of you will have seen, I suspect, taken from the global plan, uh, illustrates uh, really the cost of inaction. So the red line is where we are at the moment, the status quo. And if we don't do anything, then that's where we'll stay. Um, and it will be our children's children's children who um, are still talking about TB. If we employ, if we deploy the current tools really well, then we might achieve that green line. Um, but you can see the enormous impact that having new tools would have. And globally, and the reason you're all here, of course, uh, the tool that would have most impact in the long term would be an effective vaccine. I'm not expecting anyone in this room to disagree with me on that one. So, um, TB is different to HIV and malaria in that we already have a vaccine. BCG is one of the world's most widely used vaccines. BCG is live attenuated Mycobacterium bovis. Uh, that's the strain of Mycobacterium that preferentially infects cattle and the reason why we pasteurize our milk. And BCG has been around for over 100 years. Um, hence the decades of neglect in, in, in funding. Um, it was first given orally, and there have been many, many efficacy trials looking at the effectiveness and efficacy of BCG in different areas around the world. And the bottom line is, if you give BCG at birth, WHO recommendations are that BCG should be given within the first seven days of life. It confers high levels of protection, consistent, reliable protection against disseminated disease, particularly TB meningitis, but TB that is spread outside of the lungs. It also, interestingly, protects against leprosy in areas of the world where that's uh, endemic, of course, caused by Mycobacterium leprae. However, the story for TB lung disease is somewhat different and the reason why I'm standing here today. So really the challenge is that BCG confers highly variable and in many settings, in low and middle income settings, very low protection against pulmonary disease in infants, in adolescents and in young adults. Um, and we don't fully understand the reasons for that variability. Lara Rodriguez did an absolutely seminal study in Brazil, in, uh, reported in The Lancet in 2005, where she took 200,000 Brazilian school children um, and randomised them by unit of school to get BCG revaccinated. So they all had BCG at birth and they were revaccinated uh, or randomised to get revaccination or not in adolescence. And she showed very clearly in that study that revaccination in Brazil had no effect on incidence of disease. Now, I'll ask you to just hold that because we'll come back to that. There's some more evidence now on, on BCG boosting. But after that study, really, the sense was that boosting with BCG probably wasn't worth it. and We need to develop better vaccines to boost. I put non-specific effects there. Many of you will know about the non-specific effects of BCG. BCG is given intravasically into the bladder to treat bladder cancer, stage one bladder cancer, very effectively. Um, and there's a whole body of literature from West Africa, some high quality, some less high quality, um, suggesting that BCG may impact on all cause mortality in neonates. There's been some good work come out of Uganda recently verifying that, showing that BCG Delaying BCG leads to a significantly increased risk of non-tuberculous pulmonary infections in infancy. So that's important because if we're going to replace BCG, we need to make sure that any replacement BCG is not inferior in non-specific effects as well as specific effects. OK, this figure um, really looks at the variability and efficacy of BCG. Um, and so you can see at the top, Latitude has a very significant effect. So the closer you live to the equator, the less likely BCG is to work. Age of vaccination is important. The younger you give BCG, the more likely it is to work. That's why WHO guidelines are to give it in the first seven days of life. Um, and you can see on the bottom there, BCG strain actually has very little effect. So BCG is not clonal. There are different strains of BCG in use throughout the world, but there's really very little evidence that BCG strain has a significant impact on that variability and efficacy. OK, so if we want to design and develop a new TB vaccine, who do we want to give it to? And resources are always limited, so we have to think about target populations. The three key target populations for a new TB vaccine are here. So infants who have a huge burden of disease, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, adolescents and young adults, because they are responsible for transmission 
So although their incidence is actually lower than infants, infants don't develop smear positive TB. Adolescents and young adults do. So therefore you have a secondary effect on transmission if you can prevent TB in that population. And of course, adolescents and young adults are where the global economic impacts of this disease have its, has its effect. And as I said, HIV infected adults remain at increased risk of TB despite the use of antiretroviral therapy. The other way to look at this is to look at it in terms of mycobacterial exposure. So conventionally, we give vaccines pre-exposure to prevent infection. So in that context, this will be a prophylactic TB vaccine given to infants or given to MTB uninfected adolescents or young adults. Now, that's important to think about in South Africa. And I know some of you are from South Africa, where we've done a lot of work in the Western Cape. Rates of TB infection in it certainly in later adolescence, can be 80%. So that means you've got a quite a small target population if your vaccine doesn't work as a post-exposure vaccine. Post-exposure is another way to think about giving a vaccine. So can we give a vaccine to people who are already latently infected to reduce the chances of them developing disease or perhaps even to eradicate that latent infection? And finally, can we give a vaccine as an adjunct to chemotherapy? particularly in the context of drug resistance. There was a lot of um, interest in this as a target population um, 20 years ago, probably now, um, because it was thought that this might be a quick route to getting an efficacy signal in humans. There are no quick routes in TB to getting an efficacy signal in humans. Nothing is easy. So the other thing we need to understand if we are to develop a new TB vaccine is what kind of immune response we're wanting to induce. And unlike almost all of the pathogens you will have heard about over the last two weeks, T cells are absolutely critical for protection against TB. We know that from the animal models, but of course we best know it from HIV infected adults. As your CD4 count declines, your risk of getting TB goes up. So class two restricted TH1 flavored CD4 C cells, absolutely critical for protection against TB. There are a whole load of other cell mediated immune functions that are almost certainly important as well. Class one restricted CD8 T cells, gamma delta T cells, so-called DIRT, so donor unrestricted T cells, such as um, uh, CD1 restricted T cells, perhaps HLAE, perhaps MR1 restricted T cells. Um, and cytokines such as IL-17, particularly mucosally, and IL-2 critical for importance of central memory T cells. And after decades of considering that TB is intracellular, therefore antibodies can't get at it, therefore humoral immunity has no role to play, the field of TB is sort of waking up to the idea that maybe not all TB is intracellular, and maybe antibodies or at least some function of B cells may have a role to play in protection. And there's some emerging evidence to suggest that may be the case. So how do we put all this together? Well, because of that protection that BCG confers in the first 10 years of life, BCG really in some shape or form needs to be incorporated into a new regimen. We need to induce a potent cell mediated immune response and probably a humoral immune response as well. And broadly speaking, you can either leave BCG as it is given at birth, part well established part of the EPI program, and then boost with a subunit vaccine later in life, perhaps later in infancy, perhaps in adolescence, or we replace BCGs. We say, well, let's genetically engineer a better priming immunization to be given at birth. And of course, you could put the two together. OK, so that's sort of the theory. That's really to set the scene for the kind of things we think about in developing TB vaccines. So now a bit of the reality. So and no, I haven't forgotten to paste the picture into the slide. This slide shows you the clinical development pipeline in the year 2000. There were no new TB vaccines in clinical development in 2000. That wasn't that long ago. That was 23 years ago. And that compares, and this is where my decades of neglect comes in, that compares with about 50 vaccines for HIV at that time and about 50 vaccines for, H for, for malaria. So there were no vaccines 23 years ago. So I'm delighted to show you the pipeline today. So there is a pipeline today. We have vaccines. This is taken from the TBVI website. Uh, you can see on the left is preclinical. Then it moves through to phase three. Uh, I was saying to Roger, Roger was moaning, uh, not moaning, complaining that um, in HIV, um, you've only known about the pathogen for 40 years and you only had nine efficacy trials. Well, in TB, we've known about the pathogen for centuries. And if you put aside BCG, which doesn't really work, we've had three efficacy trials. So um, I think we win. 
Um, so um, uh, this is great, and there is a pipeline. But if I showed you the slide five years ago, and probably I'm afraid if I show you, show you the slide in five years' time, it will be pretty similar. So it is a stagnant pipeline, and that's because it's difficult to develop TB vaccines, difficult to select which vaccines should go forward, and difficult to do efficacy trials. OK, so why is it so difficult? Well, this slide sets it out, really. The trials are difficult because uh, even though there's a huge burden of disease throughout the world, because this is such a slow replicating pathogen, the incidents, even in the highest burden settings, Western Cape in South Africa, are pretty low. So you need big trials, big numbers of people, long periods of follow up. You obviously need a phenomenal amount of site infrastructure to do those trials. And that doesn't always overlap with the epicenters of the TB epidemic. The tools are really challenging. We don't know which, if any, of the animal models best predict efficacy in humans. If we did, it would be a lot easier. And we don't have an immunological correlative protection. If we did, it would be game changing. So we don't. That means we don't know which of all those vaccines that are in phase one we should select to go through to the phase 2B, phase 3 efficacy trials, because there's a real bottleneck there. We can't put everything through into efficacy testing. So how do we choose? The vaccines, well, we don't really know whether a whole organism vaccine or a subunit vaccine would be best. And if we pick a subunit, which, which antigen do we choose? COVID was easy. There was one spike. Everyone knew that was the one to go for. In TB, we've got 4,000 to choose from. And confusingly, many of them seem to protect. And the pathogen, of course, is highly adept at subverting and evading host immunity. You know, there's a reason why this pathogen has been around since the pharaohs. It's a very complex pathogen um, and we have to try and beat it. So, OK, let me give you some examples now of vaccines, really just to illustrate some points. So MVA 85A was the first new TB vaccine to go into clinical trials anywhere in the world. It was a vaccine that was developed in my laboratory in Oxford. It's a subunit booster vaccine designed to boost the efficacy of BCG. Um, MVA, modified vaccinia ankara, um, uh, smallpox vaccine used now, of course, interestingly, for MPOX. Um, and then antigen 85A, highly conserved, so one of those 4,000 antigens. Um, and after 15 years of development, um, I'm afraid we found that although it was safe, it did not improve efficacy when we tested it in an infant efficacy trial. So this trial has 3,000 babies in it from South Africa. They were all received BCG within the first seven days, and then they were randomized to get either MVA or placebo at 16 weeks of age. Followed up for three years, counted the endpoints. No difference. We had 32 cases in the MVA arm of TB disease and 39 cases in the placebo arm. So enormously disappointing result uh, for us and for the field. But the important thing is, what can we learn from this trial? And I hope I will show you that you can learn a lot from well-conducted efficacy trials, regardless of the result, the efficacy result. So we collected samples from every single baby who took part in this study. It was a really important thing to do because, of course, we wanted to look for immune correlates. Well, we didn't see efficacy, but we did still have 71 babies who got TB and all the rest that didn't. So we could do a case control analysis and look at immune correlates of risk of disease. So we, we remember these samples were taken at baseline and the infants, so they were prospective and the infants then went on to get TB or not. So we can look at what immune response was there in the infants before they got TB and how did that differ in those infants who didn't get TB. So one of the things was, why was the immunogenicity reduced? We saw that the immunogenicity in babies was lower than in adults. Um, and what about correlates? I'll come on to that in a minute. How can we make the preclinical models more predictive? Well, perhaps using clinical isolates rather than passage strains, perhaps using natural transmission models. And we probably just need to make some better vaccines. Um, but we also need to think about the criteria by which we select which vaccine should go into efficacy testing. So I talked about those correlate samples. We did, we had one vial of cells from each baby in this study. And uh, so I had my entire lab work on this. It was a military operation. We had people coming in at five in the morning to thaw the cells. Because of course, once you've cracked open a vial of cells, you can't put them back in the freezer. So we had cracked open the vial of cells. We had teams of people working on different assays. And we found some important things. So we found that HLA, HLA DR positive CD4 T cells, so activated CD4 T cells, not antigen specific, um, just all of them, um, were significantly higher in the babies that went on to get TB 
well, that's really interesting. Why? What's causing that activated T cells? Um, we also found that BCG specific gamma LE spot responses were significantly lower in the babies that went on to get TB. That's helpful because that's the readout or equivalent in many of the phase one trials. And that illustrates what we thought we already knew, which is interferon gamma and class two restricted CD4 T cells are critical for protection. What we also found interestingly was that antigen 85A immunoglobulin was also lower in the babies that went on to get disease, perhaps suggesting antibodies may have a role to play in protection. So remember that activated T cells, one of the things is what's causing that activation. And what we found, and this is an example of serendipity in science. So in our assays, we use a FEC pool. So that's flu, EBV and CMV peptide pool as a control for our assays. And my research assistant said to me, Helen, we're seeing really strong FEC responses in these in these babies. And we said, oh, that's interesting. So we sort of did a straw poll in the lab and guessed who thinks it's F, who thinks it's E, and who thinks it's C. And the answer is it was C. So CMV infection, we found about a quarter of those babies had t potent T cell responses. We're talking over a thousand spots on the rally spot. Um, to CMV peptides. Now, I interpret that as being CMV infection, because these are T cells, it's not antibodies. Um, and what we found was when you classified the infants as CMV positive or negative, CMV infection was a risk factor for developing disease, which links with the activated T cell phenotype. Now, this is really important and I think illustrates the infectious milieu that particularly people in low and middle income settings and particularly infants are, are living in, and that we need to think about pathogens together, not just as a single, single pathogen. We also found that babies who were CMV infected got their TB more quickly than uh, their uninfected counterparts. So how can we learn from this? Well, the field has moved away from infant efficacy trials, firstly, because of the increasing recognition that infants don't transmit, and also because many candidate vaccines seem to be less immunogenic in infants. They've also moved as a, or we have also moved as a field to prevention of infection rather than prevention of disease because you get a faster, quicker, cheaper efficacy trial. We had 350 cases of infection in our trial. We had 71 cases of disease. You can do the maths. It's obviously going to be quicker. All efficacy trials, the only thing that matters is your endpoints and your number of endpoints. But the key question that we don't know the answer to, and everyone must hold this in their head, is will a vaccine that prevents disease necessarily prevent infection? Infection may be a higher bar. There may be different mechanisms to protect against infection and disease. So we need to be careful to use POI to down-select for POD. OK, so moving on. So um, recent advances in the field. So... Um, two very big results that have come out since our efficacy trial. The first is this. This is a POI trial, so prevention of infection. Um, had H4 IC31, which is a protein adjuvant vaccine developed by SSI in Copenhagen, or BCG revaccination given to uninfected adolescents in South Africa. Bottom line is H4 IC31 did not have an efficacy signal in the study, um, but BCG revaccination did result in a significantly reduced incidence of sustained quantiferon conversion. Not the primary endpoint, which was quantiferon conversion, but sustained quantiferon conversion. Really interesting, of course, contrasts with that Lara Rodriguez study, but different endpoint, different population. Um, this study has now been repeated with bigger numbers um, and uh, we wait to see what that result shows. Probably the most important result in the field is this result, the M72 ASO1E, given uh, to three and a half thousand African adults, um, HIV uninfected, all MTB infected at baseline. So this is a post-exposure vaccine, 49.7% reduction in incidence of disease in those already latently infected adults um, at three years of follow-up. Look at that curve, see how they separate. I'm envious. Um, fabulous result, really important for the field. But some really important questions. 49% isn't good enough. We have a COVID vaccine that's 100% effective. We should have a TB vaccine that's 100% effective. So we can't stop just because we have something that's 50% effective. Huge confidence intervals. This is a phase two study, you know, let's see what the confidence intervals look like in the phase three study. And the key question is, will this vaccine work in people who are not latently infected? Because if it doesn't, you'll dilute your efficacy anywhere other than South Africa, which doesn't have huge rates of latent infection.
Okay, so a few other candidates. So VPM1002 is the most advanced recombinant BCG. This is an example. Uh, this is the most advanced first, uh, first in class of this vaccine. Um, some animal data showing that it is better than wild type BCG um, and some human immunogenicity data showing that it is at least as immunogenic. Now being tested in phase three trial in infants in India. MTBVAC, this is an attenuated strain of TB, rationally attenuated, developed by Carlos Martin and his group in Zaragoza. Um, again, non-human primate data there, so it's SO2 in these figures, which is what it used to be called, um, showing it better than BCG in non-human primates, um, and some human data showing that it is at least as immunogenic in humans. So let's see, that is now in efficacy testing in South Africa in babies. So really exciting. And then to finish with just some preclinical work um, that I think is, is a kind of signal of where things are going. Firstly, this work from Frank Varek's lab in, uh, so this is a non-human primate experiment, showing that mucosal BCG, giving me BCG into the respiratory mucosa, is more protective than giving it into the skin. Um, and that that protection, that is, so this is BCG muck in the figures compared with BCG, which is just standard ID. Um, and that protection correlates with IgA, CD4 and CD8 T cells in the bowel and I IL-10. One of the surprising results in our field is this result uh, shown now in two groups um, that in, and this is again non-human primates, intravenous BCG is fantastic in non-human primates at protecting against TB. Now, that was a bit unexpected, um, but you can see the, the purple on the left figure and then the red on the right. You can see it's qualitatively different than anything else. Um, I do not think intravenous BCG is a deployable vaccine for neonates in the developing world. Um, I'm happy to discuss that if you'd like to. But um, I think this is really important because we need to understand what it's doing immunologically, because then we can develop deployable ways of doing this, but just with a vaccine that is actually deployable. And then finally, CMV TB. So this is a CMV vector TB vaccine developed by Lewis Picker and colleagues at Oregon. Um, so the red, this is again non-human primates. So the red uh, at the top in the top is naive animals. And then the three bars, blue, blue and green, are animals vaccinated with different constructs. And those horizontal lines are animals that were uninfected. Again, that doesn't happen in TB. Um, so that's extraordinary. That's really interesting. The one caution I would say here is this work was done with a replicating CMV vaccine. Remember, I've just told you that our babies in South Africa if they were CMV infected, they were more likely to get TB. So again, we just need to think about this. We need to make sure it is as as, as effective with non-replicating CMV vaccines. And anyway, we need to understand what it's doing. Okay, human challenge models. You may have heard about those this week. Um, uh, there's a lot of work. We've done a lot of work. Others have too on trying to develop a human mycobacterial challenge model, because if we had a validated challenge model, we could use that to down select which vaccines go into efficacy testing. There are challenges, no pun intended, with developing a mycobacterial challenge model. Which challenge agent do we use? I do not think it will be ethical to give people virulent TB. So we've been using BCG as a model organism. Which route do we give it by? Well, we started by using punch biopsies and skin challenge, but we're now giving aerosol BCG and washing out the lungs. And the key thing with any challenge model is biological validation. How do you prove it's measuring what you want it to measure? Well, that has to be against a known vaccine effect. So we could do that with BCG as a vaccine. Um, Preclinical animal models can help, but ultimately we can only validate a challenge model in field efficacy studies. So that was a whistle-stop tour through where we are in the TB field. Um, I hope I've convinced you that after decades of neglect, there has been huge progress over the last 20 years, and it's really exciting. But we absolutely can't take our eye off the ball now, and we must continue this momentum, and we mustn't let other infectious diseases get in the way. I think we need to rebadge TB as a, an emerging or an outbreak pathogen. Um, we can learn a lot from well-designed efficacy trials, regardless of the efficacy outcome. I think a challenge model could really de-risk TB vaccine development and validated animal models and immune correlates will be transformative. But at the moment, there is no substitute for human efficacy testing. Thank you.
All right, your time for questions. So, yes. Thank you, Helen. That was a really interesting talk. I want to ask a question about corals of protection and the umbrella, what, what's under that corals of protection. Because I remember when, when I was in, in the BCG field, we also talked about corals of risk yep. and corals of progression to disease. Yep. So I'm wondering whether you could tell us anything about the progress for, for these markers. And also whether, I remember when, when we were looking at that, you know, one looked at one field at a time. So, you know, genomics, metabolomics, yeah. you know, outputs from Luminex, et cetera. Yeah. I was wondering whether there were any efforts into trying to combine them all to sort yeah. of get a market that yeah. would be across all yeah. these different fields. Yeah, it's a really important question. So, I mean, the, the simple answer is I don't think there's ever going to be a simple immune correlate for TB in the way that there is for pneumo or meningococcus or something, because it's a complex pathogen and protective immunity is complex. I think the, the, the problem with correlates of protection is the samples you have to test. You can only really strictly look at correlates of protection when you have an effective vaccine and you're therefore looking at immune responses that correlate with that protection. That's why we slightly dance on the head of a pen, a pin, and call them correlates of risk in our analysis because we actually didn't see protection. Although, of course, there were babies who didn't get disease. Um, so I think we need to be creative in the way that we use the samples that are available in the field. There have only been three efficacy trials. There's a huge correlates analysis underway with both the POI result samples, the POI trial samples, and the M72 samples. And those correlate results will be really important. Um, but you're absolutely Absolutely right. The other thing is we need to join things up. So, um, I mean, there's, there's our data from, from our study. Of course, there are things like the ZAC paper, so the transcriptomic signatures, um, that are picking up very early TB rather than correlates of risk of disease um, uh, in a kind of strict sense of the word. Um, but I think we now that the um, analysis is easier and we have tools to do these analyses more easily, we should integrate multimodal data. Um, and I'm sure that will be helpful. Yeah. Um, hello, Tabelo from Lesotho. I was just curious to know in the studies you presented how he, how um, um, infection was confirmed in the, in the infants. Yeah. And in that South African study, I wanted to know, did you enroll um, preterm infants? Was their weight cut off? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So good questions. So uh, do you mean diagnose infection or do you mean diagnose disease? Okay. You mean infection. So um, so the answer is an IGRA. So um, interferon gamma release assay. So for the non-TB aficionados in the, in the room, an IGRA is an interferon gamma release assay measuring a T-cell response to TB-specific antigens, ESAT6 and CFP10. Um, it's relatively TB-specific. It's not 100%. It is in a few strains of mycobacter, uh, environmental mycobacteria, but that was the, the um, test we used. It's not a perfect test of infection because, of course, it's an immunological test of infection, but you can't there isn't a microbiological test of infection. So it's a, it's a surrogate. Interestingly, in that POI trial, um, the primary endpoint was quantiferon conversion, uh, which neither vaccine met the endpoint. It was only in sustained quantiferon conversion because we know that um, people convert, so become TB infected, but then a lot of people revert as well and become negative. Um, and we don't fully understand what's happening. And is that just a limit of detection of the assay or is it really that they are clearing that infection? So there are there are many caveats with that indirect test of infection. Um, the answer to your second question in the infant study. So we, um, well, Angelique can tell you, um, we, uh, we based it on Z score. So they were enrolled based on, on, on sort of neonatal markers of, of health. So we didn't enroll preterm infants beyond a certain point. Um, and they all had to be healthy, basically. Yes. Thank you. The, the CMV TV connection is is really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and but then it's is it hard to know kind of which came first, Absolutely. the CMV or the TV? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so actually we can't. So the babies were all TB uninfected at enrollment. Um, and that blood sample was taken at enrollment. So we know that the CMV came first. What we don't know is whether the CMV caused the activated T cells, caused the predisposition to TB, or whether there's an, un, a, a step back and under a common immune mechanism predisposing to CMV and TB. 
Um, and it's very difficult to do these kind of studies. I mean, there's data that's come out of Uganda as well, showing a link between CMV and TB. Um, and I think, I mean, as I said, I think it really does illustrate that, that we have to think about the infectious milieu that particularly infants in low and middle income settings live in. I mean, of course, we're focusing on CMV, but there's malaria, there's helminths, there's non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, and, you know, our animal models are, don't, cannot, cannot reproduce that human complexity. Hi, thank you. My name is Trina from Canada. I was just wondering if you know of whether there are any other uh, mycobacterium species that are being used um, as a potential vaccine candidate, like spigmatis, for example. Yes, yeah, fake is not being used. Um, so, of course, the original BCG studies actually used M. microti as well as, micro, as, as well as BCG. And actually, M. microti was as effective as BCG. Um, so there's... Um, there's been a phase three trial in India, and I'm just hesitating because the data is very sketchy, with Mycobacterium indicus, um, which has never been formally reported, but was negative as an efficacy trial. Uh, but I don't know any details. Um, and then there's a whole story with something that used to be called Mycobacterium vacci uh, and is now called something else. And I'm blanking on it, but it'll come back to me. I got up at four o'clock this morning. Excuse me. Um, uh uh, which again, uh, many many trials and has has not really lived up to expectations. Yeah. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I was just uh, I just wanted to add that uh, regarding the interaction between TB and CMV, mm. if we flash back in the days we had limited access to antiretroviral therapy, yep, absolutely. when the incidence of TB was quite high, we found out in the clinical mm -hmm. setting that people who had TB, especially disseminated TB, were also more likely to have other opportunistic infections. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you admit them for tuberculosis, mm -hmm. if you have a low index of suspicion, they could actually die from viremia for the or, or fungal opportunistic infections. So I don't know what the, at the molecular level, what all the factors are, but I think um, yes. it's a well understood or well established uh, relationship. That's absolutely. No, no, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I'm an HIV physician by training and have had, you know, in the old days had wards full of people who were going blind from their CMV retinitis. The difference is that CMV, CMV infection is an opportunistic infection that people only get when they're profoundly immunosuppressed. So typically CD4 count below 100, whereas TB, interesting, because of course immunocompetent people get TB as well. So TB is the one opportunistic infection that isn't really opportunistic. And yeah, sure, your risks go, go up as your CD4 count goes down, but you can get it at a high CD4 count. Thank you, Raul from DRC. Uh, I'm just wondering to know about uh, Mycobacterium uh, bruli, which ah, is now thanks. like a neglected disease. Absolutely. Is, it, is there any cross study or cross, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. analysis this has uh, so far done about uh, those? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good point. Thank you. Mycobacterium beruli, uh, caused, uh, so caused by M, sorry, beruli also caused by M ulcerans. Um, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, the thing about mycobacteria, unlike HIV, we don't have a constantly mutating, constantly moving goalpost. Um, mycobacteria are astonishingly well conserved. And actually, you know, the most diverse mycobacteria species are probably still 70% homologous at sequence level. So um, you're absolutely right. A vaccine that works against tuberculosis could easily work against Borrelia ulcer, potentially work in cattle. We've done a lot of work uh, thinking about one health agenda as well. Um, you know, Jones disease caused by paratuberculosis, Mycobacterium avium in immunosuppressed people. So absolutely, if we can crack this, the problem is that all of, I mean, if I think TB is neglected, and it is, all of those other pathogens are even more neglected. And the kind of vaccines we're looking at, M72 with an expensive adjuvant, are never going to be affordable for those populations. But I think once we get proof of concept, we could then do experimental medicine studies testing efficacy of these vaccines and then develop cheaper, more deployable alternatives. No, so I think you're right. As a community of mycobacteriologists, we should join up. Dennis. Yeah. Well, I, what can I, I tell I, you about TB? I well, well, I'm I'm trying to to to, to uh, analyze your data here, and I'm, and I'm I'm curious about your thought about this IgG response you see mm. against 
uh, 85A. Yep. Is that a correlate or do you actually think that is a function towards the 85A? And the second thing is, did you correlate the CMV? Was an, uh, an inverse correlation between CMV gamma responses and TB gamma response or um, um, the vaccine gamma responses? So is there any correlation or inverse correlation? Between yeah, that's a good question. And... Those are good questions. Um, so, uh, so the first question I think is, do you think it's antibody or do you think it's... No, no. My question is just, is it just a correlation? Because if you have high IgG responses, you potentially also have high gamma responses from the vaccine. Oh, I see. So it's just yes. a correlation or is it a functional readout? Yes. Um, so they don't correlate perfectly. Um, and actually it was... so. It, it, you might have noticed that the significant, although the figures were similar, the significance was at the four week time point rather than the zero time point. That's after the MVA, but there was no difference between placebo and MVA group. And actually, we think it's just a maturation of the antibody response after BCG. So the kinetic of T cells and, and antibody responses after BCG are very different. So we don't think it's just a, a marker of, of T cells. Um, is the, but although, of course, that's not precluding there might be an interaction i'm sure there is um so the second question is sorry i've forgotten oh correlation between antibodies and no correlation, no, C, C, inverse CMV, correlation inverse between cmv CMV and, and, and t-cells so um not straightforwardly no is the answer it wasn't as simple as that yeah okay okay Hi there, uh, John C, United States. It's a very enlightening talk. Thank you. Um, I probably missed this, but do we have a mechanistic understanding of what leads to reactivation of tuberculosis and pulmonary TB? I was just sort of wondering if that might be a target for vaccination. Just thinking if you can interrupt the um, respiratory transmission cycle, yeah, yeah, absolutely. that might be a way to deal with things. Absolutely. So that's why the post-exposure vaccine is really important. If you can give a vaccine, and of course, M72 was given as a post-exposure vaccine. So it was given to people who are already latently infected and reduced the chances of reactivation by 49.7%. Um, do we know the mechanisms? So people study people who are latently infected as a marker of protection. Now, you can either say, well, they're susceptible because they're infected, or you can say they're protected because they haven't got disease. And we know that 90% of people who are latently infected don't go on to develop disease. 50% of the risk is in the first two or three years of life. Oh, sorry, first two or three years of infection. Um, and... I mean, we know that CD4 T cells are critical. We know that if you're HIV infected, uh, you are much higher risk. You have a 10% pre-antiretrovirals. If you are HIV infected, you have a 10% annual risk of reactivation compared with a 10% lifetime risk. So, so the overwhelmingly important factor is your CD4 T cells. Okay. 